Good morning, everybody. My name is Francesca Purcell, and I am with the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in Cambridge, Massachusetts. So uh, before kicking things off, I really want to thank uh, Moshe and Jim for uh, pulling this terrific summit together, um, and also to Alicia Smith, who all the logistics have worked out so well. I know it's a big, big lift, so uh, big thanks for all the organizers. So I actually met uh, Moshe and Jim a few months ago, earlier in the year, at the American Academy, where we held a somewhat similar but slightly differently focused uh, two-day meeting that uh, Moshe co-chaired. You're, you're getting good at this. I think it's a side gig for you, something. Um, <laughs> uh, that focused on uh, technology and impacts on work. And similarly, we had a number of different panels. And Moshe and I sort of had some discussions following uh, this, this two-day meeting, but that even though none of the panels explicitly uh, focused on education's role and responses to these developments, it came up again and again as a very common thread. And simultaneously, right around this time, the Academy issued um, uh, a final report uh, by the Commission on the Future of Undergraduate Education, uh, whose charge was to think about our nation's needs over the next 20 to 30 years and to lay out a national strategic plan to address them. And similarly, throughout this report, there was no way to, to really uh, write it without taking into consideration some of the potential disruptions that would be caused by AI and other technologies that we've been discussing here. Uh, beyond that, uh, if you do choose to uh, go to our website and read the report, which I encourage you to do, it's very good, uh, a couple of the folks you've heard from uh, over this uh, last day and that you will be hearing from, including Joseph Ayun and Michelle Weiss, served as members of this commission, uh, so you'll see some reflections in, uh, in their words in our actual final report. So moving on to uh, our session this morning, uh, I guess when you get a computer scientist and a couple of uh, humanists together, it turns out they actually didn't exactly want to follow the script that Jim and Moshe had so nicely designed for us, so we're going to switch things around ever so slightly. So as you'll soon hear, Michelle, Carolyn, and John uh, have all each been thinking deeply and widely about the future of higher education uh, in our nation and around the world in light of anticipate, anticipated changes in the workforce and indeed uh, in our global society. So they're going to provide to you an overview of some of their best thinking about some strategies and thoughts. And then we're going to ask each of you uh, to identify two of their approaches that most resonates for you that you're most persuaded by, that might be especially useful. Uh, and then we're going to really focus our discussion on a, on a sort of interactive back and forth, uh, critiquing, exploring, expanding upon uh, some of these potential ideas and strategies. And in some ways, it will also help connect us to the next session where you're uh, going to be asked to think about very specific five to 10 year strategies uh, based upon your uh, particular uh, institutions and departments and areas. So with no further ado, I'm going to first turn it over uh, to Carolyn and John to, uh, to provide their insights. Well, th thank you to everyone who uh, organized the meeting and brought us here. Uh, I'm going to say a little bit about a pro project that we have ongoing. Uh, first phase is going to be over the summer, and then we'll see what the next phase is. Uh, over the fall. There are four of us involved in kind of co-organizing this effort, and we're calling it, you know, envisioning a new global university. So that's the aim, but what we mean by university uh, and so on, you know, our, uh, you know, bears explanation, and, and Carolyn will help us uh, with that this morning. Uh, let me just say who we are a little, and then, uh, you know, hand the microphone to Carolyn since it's not very far uh, to reach her. So as you know, many of you, I know many of you here, I'm a professor of computer science. I've spent six years as vice provost. 
uh, and I'm now uh, kind of done with that. And I'm going to take about six months to figure out what this whole education thing is about and reflect on my six years is, uh, you know, actually when I left the computer science department and walked across campus, I had no idea we owned a small college at Stanford. So, you know, the whole thing has been new to me and I'd like to reflect and see where higher education should go. Uh, Carolyn is vice president for strategic initiatives and in digital education at Rice. Uh, she's a humanist professor of English. Rob Liu, another one of our four who's not here, is a faculty director of Harvard X uh, and director of the Box Center. He's a professor of the practice of molecular and cellular biology, a life scientist. And the fourth is Simona Butendiek from Imperial College, also vice provost for teaching and learning and a uh, medicine and life science person. Uh, we all started working together through the MOOC movement, so we've been in leadership positions in our re respective universities for five or six years. Uh, Carolyn and I were involved in setting up a kind of peer group across many universities. We've interacted through the Coursera Council, through edX, through an annual meeting that has gone back and forth between Harvard, MIT, and Stanford, Berkeley. And we're now kind of all at the same point in a sense of asking what can we do individually at our own institutions? What would we do better together? How do we see the future and how can we help uh, get there? So let me let uh, Carolyn give a little bit of our vision and then I'll come back and we'll share a sort of a, a brief sketch of four points, uh, four directions that we think are promising. Great, thank you, John. So we have a simple, <clears throat> and a big idea. And uh, it's an idea that asks the question, how or can we architect a new university that leverages existing institutions, um, those that you represent, others out there, higher ed um, and beyond, how can we leverage those institutions to support worldwide learning and research collaboration? And so really what we're envisioning here is a future university without walls. And by that, I think we mean with not just without bricks and mortar walls, but without the invisible walls that we have heard over the last day can be so uh, stymieing to those who are in search of uh, learning and higher educational opportunities. And so as we have that vision, we have a series of uh, concepts that we keep in mind. I guess the first is, you know, what is the problem we're trying to solve? What is the opportunity we are trying to realize? And it has very much to do with, as uh, we've heard over the last day and a half, the changing landscape, not just nationally, but globally, the changing landscape of educational need. It is just, of course, a fact that there are many, many more individuals in need of education, the thing, the thing that our institutions offer, then there is capacity to meet that need. And that is a, a quandary of supply uh, demand inequity that is exacerbated dramatically when you take into account what we have heard repeatedly uh, over the last day, that we have students not just for four years or six years, but we are entering a world where students will have periodic deep need for very targeted educational enrichment over the many, many decades of their work lives. So it is a dramatic problem, not just nationally, but globally. The second thing that we keep in mind is that technology has dramatically transformed our ability to meet this, uh, this opportunity and challenge. So over the last five years, John mentioned, we've been involved uh, in the, the MOOC phenomenon, but it is really clear that we have learned a lot about learning at scale. Uh, we have not finished our learning about learning at scale, but we have half a decade of some pretty good information. Uh, we are starting to see that peer assessment, for example, affinity groups pop up or otherwise, or powerful learning tools for individuals, AI enhanced or not. Uh, and even, I think more powerfully, we are learning that the data that we are able to get from learning at scale is powerful in terms of enriching pedagogy. So I'm thinking here, <clears throat> excuse me, of 
the learning about learning that you can get uh, from anonymized student data that can really help us understand how different learners think, the uh, challenges that they have conceptually, uh, and how we might specialize, personalize learning opportunities to really target different learning styles and needs. So the, the third thing I'll mention, then hand it back to John, is that you know, we, we're, we're clear in our minds that universities really fundamentally are, are a simple proposition. They are scholars, teachers, and students who come together uh, to share and to create new knowledge. And they're nothing more than that, um, but that is a profound thing. So in light of the new technologies that are available, those communities, those universities can be much more mobile, they can be much more porous, they can be much more flexible than we might have assumed thus far. So with that, I'm going to let John tell you a little bit more about this grand, simple, bold idea. I, I think we'll do that together here. Sure. You have uh, four points, and this is just to put something out that's a little more concrete. All of this will be fairly high level and, and we'll work towards uh, fleshing it out. But one of, one of the ideas that we have uh, oh, let, let me say a little bit about uh, kind of what we're aiming for first. Um, sorry. You know, in, in order to kind of direct our, our discussion a little bit, we came up with some things that we're trying to do and things we're not trying to do. So we're trying to understand and articulate the world need for education, research, and learning. But we're not aiming for the one true university archetype. So we're looking for a model that could be instantiated in different ways uh, by different groups or different teams. Uh, we're, we're interested in personal growth, development, diverse skills, what are often called non-cognitive factors, the whole person, as, as Farnham said. Uh, we're aiming for university collaboration and partnerships with private enterprise. Uh, we think of uh, you know, in-house professional education for an individual enterprise as being a sort of slightly different kind of, of, of discussion, but we feel that there is a chance for new kinds of partnerships between educational institutions and private enterprise, and we should explore those. Uh, we'd like to think beyond the traditional residential model, uh, and we both mentioned, I guess, the word MOOC. We'd like to not assume that, that MOOCs are a panacea or the solution, uh, but think about our experience with that as informing us as to uh, what's possible in, in different uh, situations and, and with different degrees of of uh, proximity. I think one thing, just to, to kind of say a little bit more about that, I think all of us have the experience in many kinds of projects and activities, and this is true for us as academics, it's true for people in most kinds of, of businesses. We all have experience with an ongoing project in which we fly or in some way meet together once at the beginning and once after a year and a half, and in between we do a lot of work uh, remotely and in different ways with different kinds of tools and, and uh, platforms. And, and we see that education can also evolve in some way that way. And that, so that's, I think, the positive thing rather than saying, let's just make MOOCs and then we'll solve the problem. Uh, now I think we'd like to say a little bit about what our uh, concepts are and, and where we've gotten together in thinking about the future. Would you like to sure. go first? So the first thing that uh, we emphasize is the networked nature of this. And uh, when I asked the question end of last session, uh, you know, are the challenges we face ones that individual universities as siloed entities are sufficiently robust to solve? It was a lead question, of course, to our idea. Thank you so much for agreeing with us. Um, but we do believe that this has to be a networked effort, and not just amongst the universities in this room. Uh, this would be a networked effort amongst community colleges, R1s, uh, not necessarily universities at all. So uh, we want to be very broad-minded in the network itself, recognizing there's a dramatically different set of needs out there that we need to address. We do, however, uphold the, um, the commitment to including 
diverse institutions. So it's very important to our effort that there are research institutions involved and that this network is um, in addition to a rich teaching uh, tool and learning tool for students, also a research incubator of some sort. Uh, we don't yet entirely uh, have the answers to the research programs that would be high priority over time, but the research component of the enterprise is one that we, uh, we prize and uphold. To say a little bit more about that, here are a couple of different uh, experiences rather that I've had a number of people come to me after uh, ending my term as uh, vice provost and say, what if we raise some money for you, five, ten billion dollars, would you like to go start a new university? And I think if, if you imagine trying to do that, uh, buying a piece of land, even in Wyoming, as attractive as it is, uh, breaking ground, saying it's going to be here, you know, that, that seems like just the wrong way to approach it at this point. I think it would be much simpler and much more effective to try to make a new institution out of existing institutions. There's so many good people doing good work uh, for different kinds of learners in different parts of the world. Kind of put some, a group of, of institutions together in some way just seems much more uh, promising. Uh, and productive. So we're looking for an organizational model that's networked and collective, uh, and uh, we're, we're hoping that that would be a simpler, a more per, a, uh, effective and better way to approach designing for the future than to each in our existing institutions now also come uh, approach the kind of problems and issues that we've discussed here and many others that have been a little bit beyond the scope of the discussion uh, in the last day or so. Uh, a second uh, aim is to really engage a diverse population uh, to advance individuals and build global perspective around challenges such as uh, diversity, uh, sustainability, large global problems that I think drive learning, drive the, the need for education, and drive our research projects that are engaged in trying to uh, solve important world problems. So we're looking for a broad, diverse global pro population involved in our networked university or universities addressing the global problems that are appropriate for that scale and that uh, broad crowd of, of, of learners. What I would add to that, uh, the, the diverse population that we seek uh, to convene and, uh, and encourage is a recognition that the scale and complexity of many of the most challenging world problems right now, whether they're climate change, human rights, social justice, sustainability, are uh, really quandaries and, and research uh, areas that necessitate highly diverse uh, collaborators. So these are not challenges clearly that are resolved within an individual discipline, an individual university, an individual nation. Um, they are uh, really of a scale and complexity that requires great diversity. So rather than thinking about uh, the, the diverse ambition, diverse population as an equity issue, I think we're equally committed to it as a research engine empowerment issue. The third area that we are focused on uh, is, you know, this will resonate with all of you, lifelong learning. So we see the learning arc of, um, of the world's peoples as a long one, an episodic one, uh, and one requiring uh, remarkably high quality uh, educational resources. So I think this is an area where some of our institutions have a great deal of experience going back decades. For some of our institutions, it's a new area, uh, but there have been many programs involved in continuing education, executive education, and so on. And, and so there is a lot of experience around that. Uh, another thing I wanted to mention is that uh, for many institutions in the United States, the six-year completion rate is, is the big issue. Uh, so why do we have an all-or-nothing 
a four-year program? Could, could we have a meaningful one-year programs? Like, congratulations, here's your diploma. You graduated from the freshman year. Meaningful two-year programs, three-year programs, and so on. And in that, in some way that we haven't quite figured out, how do you let people come into the university for an appropriate period of time, leave for an internship, leave for a job, come back for a period of time, and not have like a fixed four-year quantity, uh, but be a little more fluid, a little more flexible, and think through the enrollment, affinity, transfer, uh, those kind of issues, and uh, financing and cost and other things to, to allow for that. The last point uh, in our four uh, uh, points is to really uh, focus on learner-driven curriculum uh, that devises creative and practical approaches to global problems and balancing in some way practical skills and lasting foundational understanding. So the learner-driven curriculum is one that um, I referenced maybe a little earlier, global problems requiring different forms of learning. Um, I would just like to recap to help you at this point. So a uh, future global university is the idea. Uh, the four points, because you're going to respond to them in a few moments, the four points, right, are it's a networked effort, as we described. Uh, it is uh, uh, an endeavor that requires a very, very diverse community of learners and instructors. It is uh, a mechanism that supports lifelong learning. And fourth and finally, it is an endeavor that assumes and creates um, a very interactive, problem-based, applied curriculum. I'll now pass the microphone to Michelle. Hello. Uh, my name is Michelle Weiss, and I'm the Senior Vice President for Workforce Strategies for Strata Education Network. And for those of you who don't know what Strata is, uh, we're a nonprofit public charity that invests in higher education. We have about a billion dollars that we are trying to invest heavily into education. And our mission is all about completion with a purpose. It's really about trying to get students in, through, and out, and on to meaningful careers and lives. Within Strata, I run the Institute for the Future of Work, and the, the, you'll see that my approach is a, a, a tad bit different from uh, John and Carolyn's, and that's purposeful here. Um, and the reason why is because in our uh, aim to connect students more directly uh, between education and employment, we are um, quite simply agnostic to who the learning provider is. So we do believe in colleges and universities, and we do a ton to invest through philanthropy in our, in our systems of higher education. But we also are cognizant of the great amount of creativity and entrepreneurship that's going on in education, to, education technology. Um, and so you'll see that my, my stance is a bit more work-oriented in terms of um, talking about the future of education, and that's partly because I come from a background where I uh, ran the higher education practice for Clayton Christensen's think tank on disruptive innovation. So my outlook is, is slightly different, but I think with this crowd, I don't have to sort of apologize for disruptive innovation because I think you're very uh, perhaps bought into it a little bit at least. Um, but actually, the four of us were just recently, right before this, at, at, a, at the same event um, in, in Colorado. And we had the, uh, the privilege to listen to General Michael Hayden speak, who used to run the NSA. And one of the fascinating things he talked about was kind of, this is from his book, and you've probably seen him as a talking head on CNN talk about this, but he talked about how we're a credo nation. And he also refers quite a bit to David Brooks's um, uh, sort of encapsulation of uh, our way of being now as Americans as totalistic. And so what he means by that is that we used to affiliate by religion, by ethnicity, by family, by community. But slowly over time, we've seen sort of the erosion of these ideals. And so now what people are grasping to in this void is partisanship. And so that partisanship, instead of being uh, connected to um, policy, right, uh, constructive policy ideals, they are now becoming more and more associated with identity. And once it becomes very tied to your identity, then when you cleave from that, if you separate yourself from a specific 
partisan side, you are then maybe cleaving from a community that you might be connected with. And so it's, it's deeply problematic and, and complicated. And so you think about the erosion of family, race, ethnicity, religion, all these things and how it's, it's, it's doing these things to identity, but then you also have to think about the identity of work. And Farnham also kind of went into this idea of, right, the problem with idleness and the problem with um, really associating dignity and self-respect with work. Um, and I, I do think that's, that's deeply vital, especially as we start to expand our scope of who the student is in higher education, and especially as we think about a lifelong learning mechanism, um, how we expand the scope of thinking about what is it that these students are hiring higher education to do in their lives. And what I mean by that, and this is part of this kind of theory of the job to be done um, that comes from disruption theory, is you know the great marketing professor Theodore Levitt said, people don't want a quarter inch drill, they want a quarter inch hole. Right? So you don't buy products and services, you actually hire them to do a job in your life. And we have to think very critically about what students are hiring higher education to do in their lives. And so I'm going to talk about kind of, uh, if we kind of bucket out sort of the 17 to 22 year old population and then the older adult population. So first with the 17 to 22 year old population, folks already have talked about how over 80% of uh, the student population, if you look at the um, UCLA SERP survey, it comes out over and again, over 80% cite the vital reason, the number one reason why they are pursuing higher education is to get a good job. We have actually, as Strata, over the last two years, we have been interviewing 350 Americans every single day, aged 18 to 65. So now we're up to over 250,000 Americans. And we ask them over and over again these kinds of questions and double more than any other motivation out there, Americans tell us over and over and over again that the reason why they enroll in higher education is to get a better job. That that is what they are hiring higher education to do in their lives. And we have to wonder, like, are we actually delivering? And it turns out that really, in this same survey, out of our currently enrolled students, only 36% of our students feel prepared for the workforce. Only 40% of our liberal arts majors believe that their major will lead to a good job. And that's really something that we have to understand in terms of thinking about that critical handoff between education and employment. And it turns out that these students are really on to something. So in a separate research project that we just produced a few weeks ago, we actually culled through four million unique resumes with burning glass, te burning glass technologies. And what we understood was that, as Jeff mentioned in his keynote yesterday, 43% of people in that sample start off underemployed. Now we tend to think of people who go into these first jobs as like baristas or working at Target and selling clothes at the Gap. We tend to think of those as just a small minority of students who are experiencing some drift as they try to move toward a career. What we found, however, is that those people who start off, for the 43% who start off underemployed, are five times more likely to remain underemployed five years out and 75% of those folks end up remaining underemployed 10 years out. So it's not a short-term problem, it, is, it can be a very long-term problem and a persistent rut. And what's even more disturbing is that those students end up making $10,000 less per year on average. And if you think about how that accumulates over time and even compounds over time as you think about all those important experiences as they're trying to build their social capital networks, it's a substantial cost. What's even more worrisome is that for women, the odds are worse. For some reason, 37% of men have that likelihood of being underemployed versus 47% of women. So one out of three men have the likelihood of being, becoming underemployed versus one out of two women. And we don't know why, but we have to really understand, we have to start to think about, okay, what is going on here? And then you think about our our growing student population, because that population is actually p plateauing somewhat, right, as we think about those 17 to 22 year olds. But again, as we think about maybe the people for whom the alternative is not that glorified campus-based experience, we have a growing set of students who are showing these kinds of non-traditional characteristics. NCES data tells us that 74% of our college-going population displays at least one non-traditional characteristic, which means that they are not non-traditional, they are the new traditional student, right? These are people who are 
working part time, full time. They are they have families. They have geographical they have ties to a geographic region. They have so many things that get in the way of their pursuit of more learning. And what's fascinating is that we've actually again tried to sort of reach out to these folks and survey them and that some college no degree population. 49% of those folks have absolutely no intention of coming back to learning. They've had a bad customer experience, they've paid too much, they're in student loan debt, they've had all these, they don't have the time. They have, even if they know it can advance their careers, they don't want to come back. So what do we do with that kind of information? And at the same time, we know the number of skill sets that are being demanded in the workforce just simply is increasing at an ever um, you know, ever-evolving rate, where within just a three-year period, McKinsey analysts said that there were, between 2009 and 2012, the number of skill sets required in the workforce went from a little over 100 to over 900. And as we think about the exponential changes in our technology and in these futures that, that we have ahead of us, this is deeply complicated as we think about who our college-going population is, what the employers are, are demanding from these students, and at the same time, we have to add in this really, really weird aspect to, to learning, which is our increased longevity. So experts on aging and longevity are talking about how the first people to live to be 150 years old have already been born. And that's just kind of unfathomable because are we suddenly going to be living 100-year work lives? I mean, that just... And, and as we kind of con con contemplate all those exponential changes in technology, how... How are we supposed to prepare for a 100-year work life? And how are we supposed to prepare our students for work that doesn't exist? How many jobs that don't exist today will that person have during their 150-year lifespan? And we are not well equipped to facilitate these sorts of discussions. So even as we talk about lifelong learning, none of our systems, our architecture, our infrastructure are built to facilitate that kind of seamless and flexible movement in and out of learning and work. And that's where I um, get deeply concerned about what we are doing in, in higher education because as we try to make sense of that kind of longer, more turbulent work life, we have to assume that people are gonna be coming back and not necessarily in search of more college or more graduate school or a degree. And so you'll hear people talk about these micro-credentials and badges, right, and all these different kinds of ways of getting at chunking out things that might lead to a larger degree. But a lot of these folks might just be hiring uh, hi some sort of post-secondary program to just give them a cluster of competencies to move them ahead in their working lives, to get them in the management chain, or at least just maybe maintain their job. Maybe they just need some sort of kind of um, symbol of certification um, in that regard. And so we're going to start to think about kind of a broad-based education, right, that may happen in that two, four, six years that happens on the front end of a 100-year work life. It does make sense to have that kind of broad-based learning. But then above that, we might have to think about how we do certify people to move them ahead um, and give them that, that cost-effective, targeted, briefer pathway that, that does move them forward. Um, our current system, right? We can't just extrapolate from where we are with higher ed 2018 to meet the needs of the workforce of 2030. It just won't work where we are today. We can't just do that kind of simple movement. Um, we have to really rethink the way in which we engage with students. And so um, at, you, you kind of met, you heard um, Jeff sort of talk about um, these on and off ramps that need to exist. Uh, within higher education, and I believe that we really do need to think about that. And I just wanted to show you just a couple of quick images, because um, they've been kind of alluded to. Um, this is just a, I think you can probably hear me if I talk into here. Um, this is just a, a nice, just smattering of those sorts of alternative learning providers that most institutions would never consider as their peer or competitive institutions. And what I just want to show with this is that as we actually do home in on this idea of why we hire higher education in our lives, it may be that students want to hire that cost-effective, briefer, boot camp, immersive program that really does get them into the employment of their dreams. And so as much as we may, the, the profound takeaway for me of the theories of disruption is like when we actually look at something and kind of think, ah, that doesn't, that has nothing to do with what we do at our institution or that doesn't compete with what we do, it's a different level of quality, 
that's when we may actually want to pay attention because there's something else going on there. There's a reason why students are kind of homing in on a single value proposition as opposed to all the bundled services that we might provide within one place. You also heard of this notion of looping in and out of uh, universities. So at the D School at Stanford, they've come up with this idea of an open loop university where over six years you can kind of move in and out of learning and work a little bit more seamlessly and you don't get penalized, right? Because if we think about how off-ramps work in higher education, you're simply a college dropout, right? If you leave, you're stigmatized in that way and then you're often burdened and put worse off with, with some student loan debt. So this is one approach. But six years is not gonna last us that 100 year work life, right? And so one other example I just wanted to show to you, this is actually this wonderful, this is actually part of the strategic planning efforts at Tech de Monterey. And if you ever wanna just kind of look at some fun, it, look at any kind of future of education task force report, like MIT has a great one from a few years ago. But this is Tech de Monterey's 2020 plan. And the idea is to have no classrooms, facilitate uh, international learning where they are all project-based. Everything is kind of a real-world project that students are dealing with. Everything is competency-based. Professors are no longer professors, but of four different categories, which include things like being a mentor or a docent in students' lives and getting at this idea of coaching them throughout their lives and not necessarily being that sage on the stage, but an advisor to them um, and a real kind of tutor. But there's this kind of deeply sort of um, fantastical <laughs> image here, and if you can, you know, if you have time to read it, um, I highly recommend it. But it's out there. It's, it almost seems ridiculous and unfathomable, and yet they are working towards this. This is their 2020 goal. And so I, I think it's important for us to say some of these ridiculous things out loud, and that's what we're hoping to do in our session today, is for some of you to take some of these and kind of run with it. You know, if the department, you know, the reduction of department silos kind of excites you, run with that. But I think one way to think about the future of education as we build out this kind of lifelong learning system instead of just simply admiring the problem is that we are going to have to get better about profiling our students in terms of understanding what their experience means and what capacities they have now. We're gonna have the prior learning assessments of the future where we're gonna be able to do this better. You're gonna be able to map out, you know, with your trusted advisor, what it is that you want to be doing and, and what are the gaps that you have to get you there. There's gonna be more and more of a platform curation of pathways out there and there are going to be verified reviews of these pathways. That research that we are doing with 250,000 Americans and it'll exceed over 360 when we're done is to get at some of these insights. What do you regret about what you did when you chose, when you hired that particular pathway in your lives? What, do you, what did you get out of it? How, how did it behoove you in your, in your lives? And think about sort of the GPS that might exist for students as they kind of cobble together different sorts of pathways and boot camps and MOOCs and apprenticeships to build that, that momentum forward. And there is gonna be a deep connection in, in coaching and tutoring needing where, needed where people are gonna need on-demand help, right? They're just gonna need just-in-time learning and how do we build that? And how do we verify these credentials so that they mean something to employers? So that is just sort of one pitch to kind of get us thinking and just provoke our thinking as we get together in groups. And Francesca, I don't know if you want to tell us what to do. All right, now I get to tell you what to do. So um, you have heard our panelists uh, put forth a variety of strategies and approaches uh, that they've been thinking about, that they're seeing. Um, which range from curricular, what students should learn, to pedagogical, how teaching should happen, some very different models, to structural, again, some very, very different models, uh, how institutions could partner with other institutions and organizations even be replaced or complemented by. Um, and also, I think underneath here, and, and certainly in our discussions, um, ensuring that any of these responses help solve rather than exacerbate inequities in educational outcomes that are associated with gender, race and ethnicity, and income level. So what we'd like to do now, before we do this sort of you know, traditional uh, back and forth, so uh, we'd really like for each of the tables, and for those of you where there's just maybe one or two, if you wouldn't mind moving over a table, to a table there's a, where there's a few more people, we'd like you to discuss with one another 
uh, and identify one or two of these ideas that you've heard here uh, that have really caught your attention. Either that you find quite persuaded by them or maybe on the other side quite dissuaded by them. Uh, and I'd like you to take about uh, five to ten minutes to talk through some of them and then we'll go around and ask each of the tables to uh, to tell us a little bit about what you've been talking about and engage in an interaction in that respect. So if you wouldn't mind uh, getting together with one another, identifying uh, one of these uh, particular aspects and giving it a little bit more thought and discussion. All right, folks, if I can please get your attention, that'd be great. Testing, one, two, three. All right. So um, what we'd like to do now is that Carol and I are going to be uh, coming to your tables and uh, asking one of you, whoever would like to, to give us a little uh, summary of some of your comments. And John and Michelle are going to be capturing just some simple phrases so we can uh, maybe start to get a sense of uh, what some of the most salient uh, issues that are uh, coming up. So. Uh, who would like to start us off? Excellent. Okay, so the, um, we believe that our task was to think which of the ideas that we heard we would like to run with, right? And the idea that, our ta that resonated with our table is this notion of uh, lifelong education viewed as the formation of a lifelong relationship with the people who come to our university family at any point. This relationship would involve a combination of uh, mentoring, access to mentor, lifelong mentoring, access, of course, to educational opportunities, and access to networking with uh, alumni, faculty, and other members of the community. Who next? So, so one of the things that um, struck me was, um, and we discussed this at the table, is so why is work vital to your identity? And is that, you know, that's a very American um, value that you don't necessarily see when you travel abroad. And it's almost insulting when you ask someone what they do for work when you're traveling to their country. So, you know, that identity part is, is that really necessary? <coughs> and related to that, people's expectations of going to higher education to get a specific job right afterwards may be very misguided because that job might not exist in five years. So are we messaging wrong? Like, is our message to students coming to the university that we're going to place you in a job, is that really the right way to go about it? So at our table, we mainly had a couple of questions. Um, uh, one of the questions was, um, are really universities meant to be taking on as their singular or at least their number one role, placing students in jobs? Um, clearly, universities have done many other things. Uh, community service, for example. Um, uh, research is another one. And so, I mean, now I'm, I'm not saying what the table said, but uh, to me it felt like the argument I heard was very much like a D-school argument. How are we going to do a contextual literature design and understand what the customers want to produce something that, that will make them happy, which, as you know, is very effective, but often does not get to the root causes. Uh, the other question we had was on the, on the, the first talk, the one that and John and I forget her name. Carolyn. Carolyn, thank you. I'm very bad with names. Was, um, as we talked about it, we wondered whether uh, was this actually not as revolutionary as ideas as it was? And in some sense, we were asking, is it really just taking sort of business as usual, interdisciplinarity, things like that, but applying it to a network of colleges rather than to a single university? So that was just the question. Sorry. So the, the focus that we looked at was this idea of uh, alternative pathways throughout um, 
the lifespan to engage in, in higher education. And we try to come up with some practical, you know, focuses for that. And I think the intentional inclusion of uh, basically learning how to learn as a meta skill is something that hasn't come up very often, but something that I think and we thought should be an intentional part of however we um, create these alternative pathways and these possible nano degree ish or different, you know, taking apart some of our degrees if we do that, but learning how to learn and, and is that maybe possibly the most valuable skill that we have to teach as um, institutions of higher education. Right, thanks. And at our table, um, we had a discussion about how the proposition for more openly networked education is, is a good one and the push for lifelong education and the pursuit of that is also very valid. And there are some examples of smaller universities actually, you know, banding together to create synergies where there none pre-existed. We talked about a case study there. But we also discussed some of the challenges inherent with these new models, including accreditation and global scale, and um, also, in fact, are we asking the right question altogether? And that includes, um, what is the meaning of meaningful work? You might want to push we weren't exactly unified, as you can see. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I think we also touched on the idea that meta is where we should be focused, and that just because students say they want skills for jobs does not mean that is the right thing for us to do. In fact, if there are 900 skills you need, you clearly can't teach them all to your students. You need to be meta. And I would like to suggest, along with Jeff had to say last night, that we need to be thinking more forward. And that is that it's not 1920. We're not aimed at the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy. We ought to be thinking about, you know, if there's a UBI and AI is doing a lot of these jobs, then maybe we should be focused at the top of Maslow's hierarchy and, and, and giving people an education on how they're going to self-actualize. That work is not really what it's all about. Well, we talked a lot about um, really the challenges, feeling that we need to break down some of the um, walls between the silos and moving towards this sort of interdisciplinary and that these global problems that we want our students to be able to feel like they have the skills and abilities to, to tackle in interdisciplinary groups, these problems obviously don't fall nicely into disciplines. And we talked a lot about just sort of the institutional barriers that really exist there. And that also led us talking about, you know, some of these some of these things, there's sort of this balance in, and how do we prepare students for these hundred years? But there is also this reality, like we heard from Michelle, is that the reality is students still need that first position, right? So how do you balance that? And in that we came that, um, you know, the employers that are gonna be that first employer um, need to be partners in this if we begin to sort of change what degrees look like, because we still do have employers that come back and say, we wanna talk to your chemies not we want to talk to your interdisciplinary, you know, big thinkers, da 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 da, right? They still come back and say, show me your list of chemies. So they're going to have to be partners in this um, if we're going to, you know, do this without just failing our students and their ability to get that first job. Um, and, the, and the organizations that are involved in licensure, you know, and uh, things like this, whether it's engineering and education, that that has to be a partner in this if we're going to begin to, to tweak what and change what degrees look like too. Well, I think we were maybe a, a little bit more negative. Try, maybe we're too grounded in the practical and <laughs> what it takes to deliver some of these things. But um, one of the um, one of the things that I've been thinking a lot about is how to you know no question, break down these silos and barriers and spread the responsibility and wealth of all these kids who are interested in computer science to disciplines where there is very serious application of computer science. And they know it very well. They could all teach it if they really decided they would. 
um, especially with some guidance and maybe support from maybe some non-tenure track faculty in computer science or something like that. So for example, we have a department called um, Atmospheric and Oceanic Science that works closely with NASA. Huge data sets, nothing but computers. <laughs> I mean, honestly, it's, and it's wonderful, exciting work, and the kids love it when they get into it. They only have about 40 majors because nobody knows what it is even. You know, they don't, their parents don't know that, <laughs> like they do the words computer science. Um, the kids come in, 3,800 3, computer science majors. Half of them don't know what computer science even is if you do it professionally and, and in the sort of core of the discipline. They don't want to do that. They want a computer, computing application that is exciting. And so AOSC, um, astronomy, linguistics, even psychology in some areas of it. You, could, you just keep going. I mean, and then, so I was thinking, what if we created a university-wide curriculum in, say, data analytics, and I don't know what you want to label it, and have each of these units contribute a piece of it in an organized way so somebody could sample one subset and get a certificate, another subset and get a minor, the whole deal maybe with some computer science then and get a major. Um, and the iSchool could coordinate it. Couldn't you? Yes. <laughs> yeah. So that was, that was my take. I think we had, uh, did we get all of the tables have, have uh, an opportunity? Uh, are there other individuals that would um, like to offer some further remarks and observations? So as I was listening, uh, John and Carla, as I was listening to your pitch, it sounded awfully familiar to me. And then I remember that I heard, I heard it about maybe 25 years ago. It was a pitch for WGU, West Governors University. And it sounds like, you know, I'm, I'm almost tempted to take point by point and contrast them, but it sounds incredibly similar. And maybe someone here knows what happened to WGU, because I think, and maybe it came too early, the technology wasn't quite there to do what they wanted to do. Hmm? How? So anyway, I just want to have some, some com comments on the relationship to WGU. Yeah, no, actually, so what's fascinating is also the Office of the Inspector General did a competency-based sort of, um, they actually kind of uh, went after WGU, and what WGU experienced is just even further year-over-year -year growth. They're, they have um, exploded. They are over about 89,000 students at this point. They have multiple campuses. Um, and this is all competency-based education, um, so it's a mastery-based uh, model, but they are really thriving, actually. So, I mean, I mean, WGU is a great uh, competency-based program that has a very traditional uh, curriculum and set of, of goals to meet for credit for existing things. I mean, it's it's a uh, I think we're aiming for something that's a little bit more ambitious in terms of scope and who we reach and how. And I think maybe to give, uh, just to not dwell too long on it, but the fact that you didn't exactly know how well they were doing and some people do and some people don't, it shows you that there are some great ideas there, but it hasn't become the dominant view and it doesn't appear to have provided the solution to uh, say for Farnham and CMU for all the things that he's trying to do. Well, so that, there's still plenty left. To so do. I would disagree here and just say that the reason why you don't know as much about it is because it is that student, different student population where the average age is around 35 to 40. And that's not the student population we are talking about here. And so I understand completely the notion that we should not be, you know, that there's this kind of repulsion to the idea of we shouldn't be training students for their first job. But we are at a different inflection point at which higher education is so damn expensive that we can't put off thinking about that first job for our students. And especially if we know that there is a long-term effect that is, that is um, 
you know, that's something that we need to hold on to. But I think what's, what's fascinating about the WGU model is that it's emblematic of the inability for us to create taxonomies that speak to one another. So if you think about our problem with credit transfer, you know, if I take calculus here and it may not count at another institution, we're doing the same exact thing with competency-based models. So there are about 600 institutions who are very bought into this idea of mastery-based learning, but we're creating hundreds or thousands of competencies that may potentially mean the same thing, and those competencies are not exactly translatable to an employer. So even if we don't believe in training students for a job, we still have to help them way more in translating the skills that they have accumulated through their learning experience and translate it into marketable skills in the workforce. That's, what's we, that's something that we just don't do a great job at. And so that's where I think the onus is on all of us. The employers need to kind of come to the table. The universities need to understand that their learning objectives are a totally different language than the skills that employers are demanding in job postings data. So um, that's where we have like a real huge disconnect. And Moshe, the one thing that I would add to John uh, and Michelle's comments is, you know, I think uh, you mentioned timing. I think this vision comes very much out of uh, the last five years and what we are learning about learning because of the scale that we now uh, have. So I think there is that. I, I wish Rob was here because uh, he speaks so eloquently to the pedagogical innovations of, of this idea, but I think very much hybrid applied learning, um, which assumes and leverages technologies that are pretty recent on the scene. Thank you. I wanted to add a little bit to what we said about our reaction to the network proposal. Um, we like very much the concept of network, but think that we need to have something to um, start from the bottom. Uh, I personally am very interested in learning about what others are doing and what others are thinking, and then network that. Um, the, what you have mentioned about the amount of data that you have collected and the signs of learning, that's something that if you could share, that would be very interesting. So I have two comments. First, lifelong learning, everybody's for it. We don't exactly know what it is. Uh, we, we, need, we need to develop. So some universities do all sorts of things, and I also claim we do a little bit of lifelong learning with our online program. But uh, just imagine if that works, uh, the number of students will be much, much more larger. And how do we deal with it? So, uh, uh, so that needs a lot of planning, maybe another workshop like this. The second one, I, I don't like, you know, I'm an old timer. And in the table, we didn't like the idea that university is for a job or university is for specific skills and that we have to listen to the company and then teach the students these skills. We have to teach them some basic skills, so in computer science, certainly to program and other things. Some of these they will have to learn in the company. We have to teach them to learn. We, we have to teach them somehow to adapt, to find a way how to, to learn new things on their own. Uh, and that's quite a challenge pedagogically, but we may be able to do it. I think, Jim, you had your hand up for um, final comment. Yeah, actually, I'm going to just pass it to Chris, because he made a comment at the end that, that he didn't make in, in his public remarks about our table. So, okay. so uh, the comment I made is that before I moved to administration, I was studying how the internet disrupts information uh, intensive industries like news and journalism. One of the things we find whenever things go digital is that the value shifts away from content production to the platform, curation, aggregation. Uh, so remember what happened with news and journalism, right? So in this day and time, Google News, which is the curator, is much more important and valuable than the New York Times. Something similar may happen in our own industry. And currently, most of our, us are, are very much, I wouldn't call exactly learning content, it's much more than that, but we are primarily content producers. I mean, we charge for courses and degrees, which is, you know, I mean, of course, with a, with a grain of salt, is the content. And, and, and so the comment I made is that uh, 
as we look into the analogies of what happened to other industries that have similarities to us, we need to move, I mean, away from focusing on content and try to focus more on owning the relationship with our customer, which is the student, right? Um, and, and not just capitalize on offering courses and degrees and programs, but uh, and again, this is something that we need to crystallize and into concretely what it means, but, but offer the services and the interfaces that will make our students come to us first for advice, for networking, and of course for access to, to learning. Um, so that's, I think that's the point. I mean, you know, because we see every industry, right? Think about it, like even the retail, right? Who's the leader? It's Amazon, right? Amazon is a front end for a lot of third party retailers, but they are the platform, they own the um, relationship. And whenever platforms come into an industry, traditional players that are focused on content and products, they are worse off than before. So the question is, how can we avoid the fate of similarly positioned players in other industries? All right, well, unfortunately, can I, can we do one more? I don't wanna, last one, okay, last one. So this is to the whole panel, uh, the, the point that you brought up that excited me the most is when you started um, talking about engaging a globally diverse um, group of students and researchers. And I guess my question is, is our definition of div diversity broad enough? Because when I speak about diversity, I, I talk about um, indigenous uh, worldview and ontology. And I think that, you know, when you put that in the context of the fact that that is one of the things that is disappearing the most quickly in our world, even though um, we look at the plight of our ecosystem, that it's, this is actually happening much more quickly. That diversity that you talk about and that you want to engage in the scholarship and even just in the students themselves, that's, I would argue, one of our most valuable resources as humans, and that's something that's, that's disappearing much, much more quickly than we could ever imagine. So thank you for bringing up the you know, diversity in general, and you know, I just have a very specific you know, underserved and vulnerable population that I work with in my research. Thank you so much. That's a very helpful comment, and uh, some of the conversations we've had with faculty colleagues um, at Rice have underscored the importance of that and the way in which uh, some local communities could see this as a threat as well as an opportunity. Um, so we know we have to be very, very um, careful and uh, collaborative. So thank you.